Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 172nd video cast, 162nd podcast for the week ending February 2nd, 2023. Uh, welcome, everyone. Want to go th quickly through the media, and then we're going to get right down to it. First off, I'd like to thank Fitria Agranyi uh, and Maria Katarina from CNBC Indonesia for having me on the closing bell at 4.30 their time, 4.30 a.m. our time. So I was up at 3.30 today. Uh, so if I uh, uh, miss anything, uh, you'll forgive me. It's been been a long day, even though we're only halfway through it. Uh, but grateful to get on there. Great segment. Definitely listen to that a lot about the Fed. Then I want to thank uh, Rochelle Akufo, as always, and uh, Pamela Granda Tavera, Taveras and... Ivana Fridas for having me on Yahoo Finance uh, to discuss semiconductors and the uh, chip ban and the implications. And there's a lot of great information on semiconductors, which is a sector we've been talking a lot about since October, and it's really moved. Uh, so you definitely want to take advantage of that. I'd like to thank um, Aline Wirat Maha, who uh, originally interviewed me on CNBC. She's now at TVRI World, which is like the BBC of Indonesia. It's the oldest TV station that everyone watches. Thanks for having me on there. A lot of great information on emerging markets, so check that out. Uh, then I want to thank uh, Ankika Biswas, Johan Cherian, Sriyashi Senyal for having me in their Reuters article on yesterday. Also want to thank Bansari Kamdar and Amruta Kandigar for having me in their Reuters yesterday. And finally, Menya... Uh, Maynaz Yasmin for having me in her Reuters article yesterday. i uh, also like to thank Manya Saini for including me in her Reuters article on uh, at the end of last month. Uh, and want to thank Anuran Mitra for including me in his Seeking Alpha article. These quotes are all worth checking out on the website. But we're going to start with the quotes of the week. And I was going to put some of these clips into this video cast podcast but I, I i decided i want to make it short today we've been doing a lot of long ones because of all the ama questions we're going to do ama but i would strongly urge you to listen to the cnbc interview listen to uh the one with uh, uh tvri and and certainly the one with rochelle is always great i originally used to go on with rochelle on cgtn america now she's over at yahoo so uh, uh that was a lot of fun and um, uh, quote of the day, uh, this is from Peter Lynch. The worst thing you can do is invest in companies you know nothing about. Unfortunately, buying stocks on ignorance is still a popular American pastime. Uh, and that's from Peter Lynch, one of the greatest investors. And I, I can always tell by the questions people ask me whether they've done any work on, on these stocks themselves. Um, you know, when a stock pulls back $2, should I buy now? I mean, would you mark your farm to market every single week uh, if you knew it had a pretty durable yield every season? Uh, no, you would know basically what it's worth more or less. And if it moved, uh, if a real estate appraiser gave you a, you know, a bid twenty or $50,000 up or below where you thought fair value was, it wouldn't, it wouldn't even phase you because you know what it's going to produce. And that's the type of research that we try to do here and teach you on this podcast and that, that my clients obviously benefit from. Uh, another quote from Warren Buffett, and uh, this is a really important one. Great investment opportunities come around when excellent companies are surrounded by unusual circumstances that cause the stock to be misappraised. And, you know, if my kids were to ask me, Dad, can you explain in one sentence what you do for a living? I think this is the sentence. Uh, and, you know, you look at companies like Baba now on the move, but uh, Cooper Standard as of today is up uh, three and a half X in eight months. So 250 percent return. That's one of our top three positions. Now it's by far our top position because of the appreciation. We'll have to manage that uh, probably in coming weeks or months. But, um, you know, it's it's that's what we do over and over and over is uh, uncommon situations. And the, the thing I want to point out is that, you know, a lot of you have been following me and, it's, you know, many of you didn't take advantage of 
uh, not many of you, some of you didn't take advantage of opportunities that we were pounding the table on in October because it was scary and you had billionaires going on TV and super big names in the business saying, yeah, we're down 25%, we're gonna correct another 20% from here. And it's very hard not to listen to those people if you don't do your work. And nor should you listen to me, by the way. You have to do your own work because you can't have any conviction. It wasn't easy to listen to these guys that you respect and that are your, your heroes make bad calls and take the other side of those trades and come out right. Uh, but it's part of the process. No one can be right all, all of the time, uh, but it's the weight of the evidence and the experience through cycles and uh, seeing things and understanding also people's uh, mental biases, whether it's recency bias or whether it's emotional bias or whether they're you know understanding the composition of their book and why they're saying what they're saying. Uh, and there's a lot of nuance that goes into discerning. You know, I have some investor friends that say, I don't even take any out outside inputs. I think, uh, candidly, I think that's very arrogant. I, I take in as many inputs as, as I possibly can and I read all different point of views to filter out 99% because there's 1% there that I'm not thinking about that I don't even know that I don't know that that's where I make all my money from. And so I, I'm like a fire hose. I drink from the fire hose like nobody's business. I put out those reads every morning. I've got two or three TVs on when I'm not doing hard research reading, uh, you know, when I'm on the treadmill. I mean, just consistently doing that, weeding out, finding nuggets, being open-minded, constantly testing your theses, and then you wind up with with amazing results. And and uh, um, you know the beginning of this year is like uh, nothing we've ever seen. But it has n it hasn't even started. What happened in COVID? And so you know when COVID originally crashed, and a lot of you became fans and uh, started listening to this podcast because you saw. You know, when everyone was puking uh, in the hole, we had that article come out in Market Watch on March 19th, 2020, and we called the bottom, the market bottom basically the next day and went up. And then, you know, months later, everyone was puking out energy. Everyone was puking out banks. Uh, you know, no one would, would touch it with a 10 foot pole. We were like, listen, Wells Fargo's trading at a 55% discount. That was a quick double within months. Um, uh, Exxon, we went high up the food chain. That was a monster. We got out early last year, a little bit too early, but you know, we weren't pigs. That was an easy, easy, uh, huge, huge trade. Then we started looking at, you had this monster rally out of the pandemic and we started looking at what's left, what hasn't moved that could have an enormous opportunity that, that does well, that, that has high operating leverage. And that's really where, where we came to Cooper Standard. The auto suppliers were the only ones that hadn't yet moved because uh, auto didn't benefit uh, as much because they couldn't get semiconductors. There was the semiconductor shortage. And we knew the catalyst was once the semiconductors came in, the operating leverage would kick in and, you know, off to the races. Some things take a couple of years. Some things take a handful of months. You know, Wells and uh, ExxonMobil, they were almost instantaneous. Uh, Baba is taking a little bit longer, but now that's on, on the race. That's a three-year three, three year view. It could happen much faster. Uh, Cooper Standard, you know, 250% in eight months, and it's just getting started. But what I want to point out to you is that every year there is amazing opportunity that comes up if you know how to look look for it. And that's what we specialize in sector rotation, market dislocation, company dislocation, and specifically what Buff Buffett's talking about here. Great investment opportunities come around when excellent companies are surrounded by unusual circumstances that cause the stock to be misappraised. And for those of you who think that you missed it, what happened last year in the tech sector, um, you know, people get misled. They look at the Dow, they're like, it wasn't down that much. But if you look at the NASDAQ it was down 35% year to date. And Many companies were down 80 to 90 percent, some of those which are cash generative companies. So I just want, you know, my biggest problem, and that's why I know what the huge opportunity was cre that was created last year, is you haven't missed anything. If you missed the 20 percent uh, market move off the bottom and some of these stocks are up, you know, hundreds of percent, uh, that's fine. There is 
still a tremendous amount to do. And I want to just walk you through. These are not, this is not like my watch list. This is just a, simply a screen of mid cap and above that are down, you know, 30, 40% or more in the last 12 months. And you just go through these one by one. And I'm not going to make any judgments about these. Some will be bankruptcies. Some will, some, you know, it looks like they've moved so much. They haven't really even started over time. You'll get chances to, to buy back. Our biggest problem right now is that everything's working, but nothing has reached our predetermined assessment of what fair value will be in, in 12 months or in 24 months where we'll really start to lay off a lot of stock. So it's freeing up capital for all of these plethora of opportunities that are still out there that were created by the massive dislocation last year that we just simply don't have the bandwidth because there's nothing we're willing to sell to put into these. So uh, that's an opportunity for, for new people, et cetera, to not get stuck into FOMO and chase the things that are just going up, but start to look at what's been left behind and why and kind of, you know, the easy weed is the ones that are losing money that don't have a history of making money. Those are, are you can leave for dead. But um, some of these others that are real opportunities, I mean, you know, t- just looking at this, I mean, I'm not doing anything with this tomorrow, but, um, you know, my friend Phil just texted me about, you know, let's take over JetBlue. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about taking it over. I haven't done enough work on the stock, but you know, this, this one doesn't, yeah, I, I, I'd probably look at the debt first, but I mean, there's a lot here to, that, that hasn't moved yet. That is going to move, you know, the office stuff. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, that's not an easy trade. We talked about it last week, but the one, the highest quality ones are going to do fine. The marginal ones could be in a lot of trouble. Uh, because there is more remote work from home, but you're seeing more and more companies like, hey, it's not even the companies now demanding people to go back to work. It's people going back to work because they want FaceTime because they don't want to be part of the next 10% that's laid off, particularly if they're in tech. So, you know, we may be doing work on some of the ones in this, but this is just a random screen. But I, I just really want to emphasize that you, you've you missed nothing. The game is just starting. What the market served up last year is generational opportunity in certain parts of the market. And I tried to pound that home in October and November and then in December when you had that mini sell off. Uh, and now everyone seems to be coming around uh, to to the same side. And there was really only one other person that really held their ground through this uh, that I would say is Tom Lee and uh, and also Seth Golden. Uh, he stayed rationally based in the facts. He he has a newsletter business uh, and Tom has a newsletter business. Um, uh, but I, I feel bad for the ones that were bullish and got caught up in the emotion and flipped bearish exactly in the hole. And now they're trying to double down on their bearish and now they have like real career risk. And it's it's sad to see because they have a longer term track record of success And they just didn't have the fortitude to carve away the emotion and just deal dispassionately with the data. Um, And then, you know, they'll wind up flipping back at the exact wrong time after you've had a big move. Then you'll get the 10% correction. And it's just, you know, it's it is what it is. But what we do is a lot easier, which is we don't have to predict the market. We have to look at which businesses are high enough quality that have been impaired. I mean, look at some of these things that. Yeah, they'll take time to build bases. You don't have to worry that you missed the first huge leg of the move. Uh, there's there's plenty to do. You don't want to fall asleep forever. You know, it's time to it's time to go. It's it's go time. It's game time. But uh, for all that you missed in the last four months, um, there's so much to do. I mean, it's it, the only limitation is more capital. Uh, there is some really quality i'm looking at the i'm salivating at some of these names right now i'm just just telling you i'm also drinking coffee because i've been up since 3 30 in the morning so uh uh, you'll uh excuse me if i'm a little over exuberant here but i mean this is like i i you know buffett talks about skipping to work every day i i just feel like i'm on a treasure hunt every single day and because of years like last year are the greatest things that could ever happen because it serves up opportunities like these these are not penny stocks 
and and by the way, 60 or 70% of the ones I'm looking at, I can immediately eliminate. That's my job in this business. It's not finding what to do. It's finding what not to do. The process of elimination is the most valuable skill in this business. It's the exact antithesis of being an entrepreneur is taking as much activity as you can. Being an investor is, you know, uh, um, avoiding as much activity as possible. Um, I mean, th these are, I, I just love it. I just love it. I'm seeing these companies report these one and two bad quarters. And when you listen, you read through the transcripts, you realize it's like, it's completely a temporary impairment. There's just so much to do here. Um, so if you think everything's overbought and I mean, oh my goodness. It, and it's, it's really great when you zoom out yeah, on a monthly chart. Cause if you look at the daily, like they're just straight up already. And if you look at the monthly, it's like the game has not even begun. This is nine pages of, um, four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 25. So you're looking at 225, you could probably immediately eliminate about 60. So you got a hundred stocks. I mean, all you need is 10 to have a monster portfolio that's gonna triple over the next two years. And there's more than that in there. Um, Okay, let's get down to, oh, I love this headline. I'm not sure why we're on this page, but um, Alibaba traded down a couple points. I think it was on Friday because uh, people thought they were moving their headquarters to Singapore. The, the reason that Chinese stocks traded down a couple points and they're consolidating is exactly what we told you was going to happen when it hit 120 is when it's gone up 100% in three months, it was definitely going to consolidate, but people were hopeful that it would go back down to the 90s or 80s. And I just don't think, I mean, if you get super duper lucky, you may get high 90s, but I highly doubt it. I think that train has left the station. I think the pain is pushing up and catching all the people that are still skeptical uh, off sides. But um, okay, so let's do some of the articles of the week here. NASDAQ Stellar Return could squash techs. How NASDAQ Stellar Return could squash techs bear market by March. That's from Jack Denton. He does great articles, by the way. You definitely want to follow him on Barron's. Um, okay, short sellers feel the pain in stock markets 2023 rally. Those are all the triple break putt people who got the first two breaks wrong and now their ball is in the sand trap and they're still trying to double and triple down that their third break is going to be correct. Uh, and uh, what the only thing is correct is career risk. Uh, why auto marketing looks poised for growth in 2023. Why is this important? This is exactly what we've been talking about in the context of Cooper Standard is used cars are going to do poorly because no one's going to finance a car even if the price as the prices come down at seven eight nine percent new cars are going to do great because the average car on the road is 13.1 years and um dealer incentives are going to come back and tesla started the game you know ford and gm had this beautiful duopoly where it was a wink wink nod nod kind of controlled supply partially because of the semiconductor shortage uh, where they could charge above ticket, still make margins, still have good quarters. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I remember talking and I said, look, you're going to have the Kias and you're going to have the um, Hyundais come in and they're just going to flood the market and the, the volume is going gonna, is gonna to start to fly. So Tesla was the one that did it with cutting prices. The, you saw in the earnings that the semiconductor, the supply, earnings are up because the supply chain problems are, are eased and and now you're going to start to see the marketing which is i.e incentives which is commercials which by the way will help some of these digital marketing companies and uh, uh tv franchises once that that uh, uh marketing ramps up but you're going to start seeing zero percent apr and i talked about that with rochelle on yahoo 2.9 percent apr and everyone's going to go out there and get new cars and they're not going to be selling above sticker they're going to be selling below sticker you're going to be able to go in get a deal get zero percent or one percent or two percent financing in a seven percent market which is just a, a a boon that everyone's going to love uh and for those of you saying the customer is not doing well uh we're going to look at some data versus feelings and anecdotes uh that says otherwise uh ford cuts prices of the ev uh mustang mach e they got to compete with Tesla. The guy's like, I'm not going to lose share. This is huge for us because we don't make money on Ford's margins. We make money on Ford, Ford's 
units and the more they cut the price the more people buy the units uh, and it's the same for gm and it's the same for tesla so as these guys race to the bottom and they start marketing and they start competing on price the units are going to go back to 2017 le levels and that's when we get cooper standard doing you know five six seven eight dollars uh uh in normalized uh earnings power you apply a, a trough multiple of 10 or a peak multiple of 20 your your pick uh, and you know, you're looking at 250% gains. It hasn't even begun is the way we look at it. That's not to say you don't get consolidations. That's not to say, you know, you couldn't get a bad quarter, uh, earnings report, you know, this quarter or next quarter, as you work through kind of the early stages of the recovery, it's immaterial. All, all that would create if the, you know, it's unfortunate, it's, it's not going to happen, but like, all that would create is an opportunity to buy more. We bought every penny that we wanted at 550, so we're not going to get that opportunity again. But uh, if you feel like you missed it, may maybe you'll get an opportunity at a more reasonable price. I wouldn't hold your breath. Okay, moving right along. Cooler pay gains add to debate on when Fed might pause hikes. We'll cover a bit more about the Fed, but uh, it was a completely different... Um, chair powell yesterday he had an, he had the, every opportunity you can look at some of the quotes i did in um seeking alpha and reuters he had every opportunity to destroy the market yesterday he chose not to it was not jackson hole j it was um uh you know more dovish j and that was a, that was uh readily welcomed by the market imf the most one of the most you know whether it's the imf or the world bank they they always put out the most pessimistic reports about the economy it's like European banks. If you want to, if you want the bear case on the global economy in any uh, circumstance, any time, just start with SockGen, read their strategist reports. It doesn't matter who the who the author is; they're always negative. The French are always negative. Then, if you want uh, second bear, most bearish, just just get uh, Credit Suisse. If you want a third most bearish, Deutsche Bank, and right there, it'll make you want to you know jump out a second story window uniformly through bull markets bear markets etc and the imf is right up there uh and uh, for them to come out and upgrade the global outlook as inflation eases is beyond bullish because the amount of positive data that they have to be seeing globally namely because of china's reopening uh has to be overwhelming for them to take anything but an up uh a downbeat view and this is upbeat when not everyone is even on that uh side of the table yet so uh, GM's fourth quarter profits soared as supply chain problems eased. That was our whole thesis. If you remember in May, we were saying the chips are coming in, the chips are coming in, watch what's going to happen. And here we go. Just beginning. Bond King Jeffrey Gunlack says he expects one more Fed rate hike. That's the base case. It's now, I looked, I think 87% chance. It was 83% at 330 this morning. So it's 87% chance of one hike and basically done. 13% uh, chance of they're already done. That's going to be dependent on the jobs report tomorrow and the jobs report that comes in before the next Fed meeting in mid-March, as well as all the inflation prints. Uh, if the jobs are, if you get a negative print on jobs, which I don't expect tomorrow, but you never know, uh, but certainly potentially next month, that could be it for the Fed. He could be pulling a Bank of Canada and, and pausing or Bank of Malaysia or Bank of Indonesia or Bank of Philippines, which is now also going to be the fourth, uh, third or fourth to pause. Um, and that would be a positive thing. This is the property thing. New York property tycoon to give worn out offices back to the bank. So he's basically uh, doing jingle mail and mailing the keys back. This is a major player uh scott retchler plowed billions of dollars into manhattan office properties after the 2008 financial uh, crisis amassing one of the city's biggest portfolios through a flurry of deals now he uh chief executive property developer rxr is preparing to surrender some of his offices to lenders uh the, you know the construction loans are too expensive i i play golf with well, I don't play golf in january but i see these guys at paddle and everything uh big developers that are doing major buildings that you would know in New York. And a lot of the projects are getting paused because the financing is too expensive. That, that'll start to change by the end of the year. Um, but he's basically set, talking about this divergence between kind of rundown properties that aren't near public transportation. Uh, and he goes with some of those, I don't think there's anything we can do with them. 
uh, you know, in terms of like they don't want to invest the money at this high a cost of capital to either convert them to residential where there's a housing shortage in New York or upgrade them to like this Vanderbilt building that has all the newer amenities of offices, which everyone wants. And it's also near Grand Central Station. Um, I would take the other side of that. I mean, for me, I, I think it's a little early, but I think this guy's selling in the hole. He's trimming. I mean, I, he's opportunistically trimming. He just doesn't want to deal with the headaches. Why wait it out and carry it uh, with the expense of capital? But guys thinking like that are going to create opportunities for smaller operators who have cash that can go in and ride this out because as some of those older office buildings are converted to retail, you're going to have a shortage of office. And as the labor market becomes uh, looser, more and more employees are going to be flocking back to the offices. And, and as that happens in one business and productivity increases, all the businesses are going to demand it back and they're going to figure out like there'll be flexibility if you want to take a Friday off or whatever, but there's not going to be this two in the office, three out and trying to coordinate. So everyone gets in and, does one fake meeting a week and pretends that they're busy and productive. I mean, that, that gig is up. And, um, I, 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 I see a pony in the pile here, but I think it's early and I'm spending time on this, not because I'm a real estate guy, because there are super heavyweight real estate guys that listen to this podcast that can run a hundred thousand circles around me. And so I'm not adding any value here other than, um, I think there will be a pony in that pile. I just don't know when there are better people suited to, to pick that out. But when I see articles like this, I'm kind of like, this is, th and I see how um, Steve Roth's uh, Vernado is trading and SL Green is trading and Boston Properties. I mean, these are all real guys that are no joke. That'll figure it out. They're, they're not, they're not going to be toasted. Those guys are never carried out on a stretcher, not during the great financial crisis, not during the SNL crisis. These are guys that um, dig their well before they're thirsty and they're not going to get pinched in this, in this softness either. So there, there's opportunity in there, but like we did in 2020 and last year, you know, when we were buying China, what did we do? We bought the highest quality company in the middle of uh, three times in 100 year, 80% drawdown in China tech. We had NASDAQ tech in 2000. We had the Dow Jones in uh, 1930, 31, but we went the highest on the food chain. Uh, and we're going to show you why here, it, it, which was exactly part of our thesis. Um, I want to get right to that article. Gosh, where is it? Here it is. Okay. Which was, let's look at this. China's e-commerce market sees at least 89 platforms close in 2022 amid COVID controls, fierce competition, and weak spending. What happened during this crisis is opportunity. The big got bigger and picked up share. All these new comers that were trying to take share with little niches are now toast. And who's left? Tencent, Alibaba, Pinduoduo, and JD. And that's it. It's basically an oligopoly and you even see it here that even though all of these platforms, 89 competitors to Alibaba shut down, the total volume of e-commerce actually went up even in the worst year in history. I think it went up two or three percent year on year uh, and now they've got 89 less competitors. So. Uh, this was exactly what I said about what happens when government regulates the, the big guys uh, or, or cracks down on a sector. The exact opposite intention of the government happens. The, the intent of the government is to uh, weaken the strong and the net effect is they strengthen the strong because their new regulations and crackdown kills the 89 small players and when when the dust settles and the fed and the fed and the government pivots back to normal which they have in the last four to six weeks the big come out bigger with greater share with greater business with greater strength and with greater earnings power and cash flow 
and you're gonna see that. And that's when why we went highest up on the food chain and we didn't blink when everyone else was puking in the hole and uninvestable and all the noise that you saw. And even some of the most bearish people in the China market ha have now become the most bullish proponents. Remember, opinion follows trend. And we continue to repeat that through the cycle. Well, guess what? Here is the cover story on Barron's for this weekend. And here's what it says. China's big comeback is just getting started. How to play it by Rejma Kapadia, our newest China bull, who's been writing fantastic articles on China. So I'd suggest you follow her. Uh, but it all—it wasn't always that way. And this is a great article, and I give her credit. And she got on the front page of Barron's, which is an unbelievable accomplishment because uh, she's got it right now. So uh, you know, it just goes to show. So Chinese education stocks gain after post crackdown business overhauls um just shows the resiliency everyone thought that these guys were left for dead they you know like a phoenix rising from the ashes they started selling eggs and i don't know what the hell else they're doing different types of tutoring but they're making money <laughs> and uh, like the government literally shut these guys down in august they're like okay we'll shut down but we're gonna sell something else and now they're off to the races and they're basically gonna go back to selling exactly what they sold before and the game will be back on just like it always is uh, China kicks off 2023 leading global peers with equity fundraising. Uh, so if you think the capital markets are closed, now people want growth. China's got the growth for now, next three to five years. And then after that, uh, won't be the case, but we'll, by then we'll be on to India. But for now, the game is on and we're going to have one last parabolic move in China for sure. In our view, China's economic activity rebounds sharply after reopening. Their manufacturing PMI went into expansion above 50 um and their services sub index hit 54 anything above 50 is expansion anything below 50 is contraction or recession and not, well not recession because they didn't go negative but uh contraction chinese customers embrace life free from covid zero controls uh taiwan stocks enter bull market as chip shares extend gains wait chip shares extend gains remember China was going to invade Taiwan. Remember that in October when China was uninvestable uh, and uh, and while everyone was puking in the hole and we were buying Ali, more Alibaba in the hole uh, uh, and Buffett went in and what did he do? He bought the country that was going to get bombed. He bought Taiwan Semiconductor in size $4 billion and that's what's made him the best of all time and we just try to humbly follow a fraction in his footsteps and it works very well. So. Um, you know, here we go, off to the races. And by the way, a friend of mine was out to dinner with a major ambassador. Uh, I can't go into more detail than that. Major ambassador that does a lot of business with China, use your imagination. Um, and what he said was, it's not, there's no invasion happening in the next three years. It would be 10 years out if that low probability and that's been our base case since day one because all you you just have to logically look through game theory apply probabilities to different things cut your cut cut your optimistic scenarios in half and 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 at some point you got to you got to take a shot so then the question becomes okay if this one percent outlier could happen is the sizing of pos of this position such that if it went to zero would they take me out on a stretcher? And if the answer is no, then you move ahead. If you got a 1% outlier where you're going to get blown up uh, and your sizing is such that it's not going to take you out on the stretcher and the rest of the portfolio will, will more than make up for it, uh, then you got to take the shot. And that's exactly what we did. And it's been a monster. So, uh, and it's just beginning, by the way. Th this one, it's taken a little longer. It's going to be bigger over time. And uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, China junk dollar bond prices swing from record low to longest winning streak i mean three months ago when we were doing these and by the way you should all go back go to hedgefundtips.com scroll down to video cast on the right side video weekly recap or podcast and just click on some of our podcasts from october when everyone was puking in the hole and what we were saying and and not like crystal ball like we we can see anything we just showed you data you know measure by measure oscillator by oscillator positioning by positioning sentiment by sentiment earnings by earnings and we said look 
this is a flush out. This is the opportunity. Step in. It, it, and remember the famous saying, if you're not buying here, find another business. I don't know what you're doing. If you're not buying when the opportunity is served up like this, then find another business. It's not for you. Because opportunities get served up like that so infrequently. And when it, when it rains gold, pull out the bucket, not the thimble, is what, is what Buffett says. And that's exactly what we were doing. And many of you were as well. So uh, China Stock Rally Cools as Benchmark Flirts with Bull Market. So uh, I, this was from, uh, I think, Monday when I was on um, uh, the Indonesia show. Uh, it had, the CSI 300 onshore had just made a bull market in China, uh, rallying 20% off the lows or whatever. Foreigners scoop up China shares with January inflow at record. So, you know, when you have this type of inflow, you have to screw them. Uh, it's just the way the market works. So, you know, Bob at 120, you take it back to 110. Did it screw enough of them? Maybe enough, maybe at 105, it'll screw enough of these Johnny come lately's and then they'll puke it out. Some smart guys that don't have enough will, will add to their positions and then, then they'll take it straight up to 150, 160. Uh, and then flush out the next batch of suckers who buy at 160, take it down to 140 and so on and so forth. So that, that's just the game. It's the way it happens over and over and over. Uh, Xi urges efforts to spur consumption to drive growth rebound. What's unique about this, and I covered on, um, I think CNBC, was that this recovery is different. In all past recoveries, the stimulus and the uh, accommodation has been focused on infrastructure to drive the recovery. This time they've switched it, and they've switched it to focus on driving consumption uh, uh, to drive the recovery. So they're investing in consumption and the platform economy. And the platform economy is very simple. It's Alibaba, number one, JD, Tencent, Pinduoduo. And, and they are the toll takers for consumption, which is what the government has now mandated. That's how they're going to take their stimulus to get their recovery versus building, you know, empty cities and uh, things that uh, are superfluous. They want to become a consumption-driven economy Follow the U.S. model, 70% based consumption. That I don't think they'll ever get there, but they'll try to get as close as possible. And in the meantime, we own the toll taker. Uh, we're going to make a ton of money off of that. So uh, Macau is back. Choose your stock bets wisely. So you've seen all the casinos rock and roll. That was another theme last year that we were pounding the table. All right, a couple of tweets from Seth Golden. Um, assuming the market finishes the week on trend uh it's likely to express a golden cross so that'll bring in a bunch of these people that make a, you know think squiggly lines matter but you, it'll get a lot of headlines that the s p has done a quote golden cross when the 50-day cross is above the 200 uh and that'll bring in a lot more more retail buyers in the short term and maybe push this up further the key is you broke the downtrend line you broke this uh whatever line head and neck line uh, and it's it's breaking out. So it'll be fits and starts, but it's working its way higher, and that's good. But you don't want to sleep on these. I know I went through 200 stocks, 100, you know, 50, you only need 10, but you don't want to leave another month or two because these things, when they turn, they turn hard, and you've already seen it with a whole bunch of them, um, you know, many of the ones that that we, we've been pounding the table on, but there's a, there's another class another vintage for those of you who follow wine i'm not a wine drinker at all but there are a lot of people i know love wine and they talk about vintages and all this other stuff uh i just showed you the second class of wine so what we focused on was class of 2022 we got in all this stuff that's that's ripping now there's a whole nother class that's late 22 early 23 that's going to be ripping for the next 12 months so uh, now's the time. But by the end time you get to mid or end of 2023, the pickings are going to be slim and you're going to be, you know, clawing for scraps, so to speak. Um, OK, this is a Nasdaq high low ratio. I think he got this from Sentiment Trader. It just basically shows that uh, when cycles from bottom green line to 0.29 red dots happen now, this is represented a good area to be a buyer. Six to 12 months returns positive 100 percent of the time. So we got down here. And um, it's, it's working. Uh, this is just another chart that's been saying what we've been pounding the table since October, that the market bottomed six to nine months before earnings bottom. No one believed it. Now it's happening. This is from, I don't know where he got this from, but um, it shows that the market would have bottomed 
in October. So if you count six to nine months ahead, earnings will stop going down by March or even as late as June. My bet would be March, maybe another three, four bucks uh, in the S&P estimates. And then uh, that'll be the end. And then the market will start to discount the recovery in 2024 earnings, which we talked about last week. You know, we were trading at 16 times. Those earnings could even go up and it'll make the market look pretty cheap uh, in the recovery. So remember, I always said the market bottoms on high multiples, not low multiples. And that was the whole theme for the last quarter. And now it's playing out. This is really interesting uh, from yesterday, actually. I can't believe this is as recently as yesterday. So bearishness is pervasive. 70% of respondents in the Bloomberg survey believe lows for the S&P 500 will not happen until the second half of 2023. Stocks are poised to hit new lows this year, survey of investors show. Roughly 70% of the 383 respondents in the survey say the stock market has yet to hit bottom Biggest weighting, 35% says that lows won't be in until the second half of 2023. This is the wall of worry where major bull markets are birthed. And um, I'm shocked that this is that this, this is the end of January. This type of stuff is coming out. Um, Mind-boggling, but thank God. I was worried that too many people were getting too bullish too quickly and the pullback, you know, any consolidation pullback would have to be more abrupt to shake them all out. But with this type of uh, thinking and this type, you know, granted, it's only one survey, but that's amazing to me. Uh, going out on a limb here and saying any survey that suggests folks are having a hard time paying their bills may be just what people say and far from reality. This shows, this is from Morgan Stanley, uh, home of the triple break putt, by the way. Uh, but liquid assets, apparently this is another side of the bank, liquid asset, assets per household up significant. So the top 20% obviously have the most uh, benefits. Uh, this is not even, this is just in real terms. It's not in percentage terms. So that would make a lot of sense. Uh, but it shows their cash and time deposits per household by quintile. Um, and although it looks like the top 20% have so much more than the bottom 20%, if you think in terms of like the earning power, if these people are earning, you know, a million bucks a year and they've got an extra 135,000, uh, you will call it 10%. Th these people may be earning 30 and have 7,000. That's 20%. So, um, but the point is that everyone has significantly more deposits today, even after a year of spending, than they did in Q4 of 2019. The people with the most cash, by the way, in the entire world are the Chinese cu customers who saved up 2 trillion US dollars, not renminbi, U.S. dollars, two trillion U.S. dollars that they're just dying to spend now that they've been released from their pri COVID prisons back into the world. And they are starting to spend with the Lunar and they're going to continue to spend. And we are the toll takers at Alibaba, uh, which, which is just exciting. But this is America. Yeah, they're running them down, but they're still well above pre-COVID in terms of excess savings and opportunities. So there's some runway there. OK, Hawk on a Wire stock market and sentiment results. On Wednesday, we got a declawed hawk in Chairman Powell, and he treaded carefully. It was as if he was a hawk on barbed wire, knowing if he swayed too far to either side, he would get cut. For the first time, he acknowledged we are in a disinflationary environment, and goods inflation is coming down fast. Powell attempted to temper the dovish sentiment by saying there was, quote, more work to be done, and the dot plot could go higher or lower. At the next meeting or lower that <laughs> uh, wow okay just wow that he said that in my opinion because remember it's at 510 right 5.10 we're already at 5 uh, 475 so 25 more we're at five that he's basically saying we could be done uh and the market uh heard it loud and clear in my view the most important qu quote of the press conference was quote you saw what the bank of canada did and we spent uh, all of last week talking about how the Bank of Canada paused and that the Fed should follow suit, if not this meeting, which they couldn't do because it was already priced in, the next meeting, which we expect them to do. Um, I'm convinced that he is a reader of our blog. Kidding, not kidding. Uh, considering our article and podcast from last week was exclusively focused on how the Bank of America paused last week and Powell should follow suit. By the way, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. 
I, I have these shows on in the background and you know how many uh, articles of the week I use songs. People are now not just using the ideas. They're using the songs. They're like, this is a Garth Brooks, Friends in Low Places stock market. I mean, I was like, really? That was last week's article. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm flattered and, and honored that, that they consider uh, reading it. And uh, hopefully they're benefiting from it. There, there was a guy. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't want. There was literally a guy reading my script about Cooper Standard a few weeks ago. Uh, on one of the major stations and but he said he was getting out at $11 because it wasn't his own work um, and then I searched our email list and of course he was a subscriber and then the next day he was on a different station literally giving the exact same script on Alibaba you can buy it at 2014 prices earnings are up 500 percent revenues are up 800 percent like hmm I I've heard that a couple times before but god bless I mean look I'm honored that they're benefiting from this. I'm honored that they see things, that they, they agree with what we're saying and they're making money from it. And that's that's a good thing. Um, okay, CNBC. Uh, okay, we covered all this. You should check this out. This is probably the most important video. There, there's no question you'll get value if you listen to the, the clips. And I'm not gonna go through all that now because we've got some AMA questions. But this Barry Sternlich, he's the first one who said what I've been saying about the Fed's limitation with the debt to GDP at 120% versus when Volcker was in at 33%. Uh, and he's a major real estate guy in uh, Miami. You definitely want to click and listen to this because he he just puts it in a nutshell. It will ring true because you've heard it many times before here. Uh, but it's always nice to hear a different kind of slant on it. And I, th I thought he nailed it on CNBC. And more likely than not, if they're not reading this blog, they're definitely listening to, I think it was Squawk, Squawk Box on CNBC that morning, and he was phenomenal. So check that out. Um, okay, disinflationary, we covered that. All right, so you can read all that. The TVRI, we went into some important stuff about emerging markets and what happens when the dollar comes down. Um, some other highlights from the meeting in response to a question from CNBC's Steve Leisman, Chairman Jerome Powell said it's certainly possible that the Fed will keep its benchmark interest rate below 5%. The Fed's latest hike brings the federal funds rate to a range of 450 to 475, which basically means he's saying the final 25 basis points is not a foregone conclusion. But what does he need for cover? He needs a negative print with jobs. And I, I don't know that he'll get it tomorrow, but he could get it in that meeting before next month. And then he can pull a Bank of Canada and we're off to the races. Then we can get back to focusing on fundamentals. It's like we spent 18 months talking about COVID and we navigated perfectly through it. Then we've spent another 12 months talking about the Fed and we've navigated very well through it. And then we're going to be able to get back to business uh, and focus on companies, which is even even better and more exciting. Or the companies will start to reflect <laughs> fundamentals versus what Powell feels like uh, before a, uh, a major Fed meeting announcement. Um, some good stuff on the chip band and chip inventories with Rochelle. Definitely check that out. Um, and selling in the hole. The stock market bottomed in early October is our view. Uh, here's what we were saying. Watch the CNBC and Yahoo Finance clips when all of the, quote, big names in the business were telling you that the market was going to correct another 20% after already correcting 25% in October. I'm sure many of you remember it well. I'm sure many of you remember the AMA questions about the major people who were saying that the market was going to go down 45%. Um, uh, and if you click on this link, it'll take you to a Yahoo uh, link that I did in studio about the U.S. markets. And then a CNBC link uh, when my buddy Will Caloris was laughing. He's like, so you really like Alibaba down here? I was like, I love it more than ever. You got you to check out that clip. It was, it was fun. Um, uh, okay, so here's the S&P. This was that magic line we talked about last week that everyone was focused on. All the bears were saying, it's just more of the same. We're going to bounce off. Well, we broke through that. We broke through this whatever shoulder thing. And I think we're even above that today. Wow, Nasdaq's up 3.71%, guys. Remember tech? We were talking about tech and like almost embarrassed about it because no one was talking about it. Well, there you go. That was the last thing people wanted to buy. But we did distinguish that we wanted cash generative tech. We didn't play in the junk tech. I think even some of the junk tech is rallying now. Um, 
Okay, so let's see. Uh, this is from, oh, this was, uh, we talked about with um, Kristen Scholler uh, before the end of the year. We said it, we, we thought we could get the Santa Claus rally. We got that. Then we got the first five days of January. Now we've got the positive January, which means that all three triggered means on average you get 17% up. Uh, Ryan Dietrich put a more comprehensive uh, uh, addition to this. Not only do you get all three up, but if you get January above 5%, which we did, the average return for the full year is up 29.7%. It's only happened five other times post-World War II. So we could be in for a better than expected year. I don't know if I'm that bullish. I think what's going to happen is you're going to rip up to 46, 47, maybe 4,800 if the positioning's really bad and people are flat-footed, uh, right around new highs. And that's when everyone's going to jump in on the breakout. And then we won't make much, many more highs for the rest of the year. We'll go sideways until the end of the year uh, and not allow the Johnny come late least to make money. That's just that's just the way it generally works. I'm not trying to predict anything. We'll adapt as the data adapts. But retail is still bearish here at only 29.9% bullish. Um, the overall fear and greed is is getting a little bit toppy. So you know that could be a short term consolidation just to shake out some of this Johnny come lately money. Uh, and the National Association of Active Investment Managers. Let's take a quick look because they always print after I do the article. Uh, all right, let's see here. It's at 78, so not much change. They're, they're chasing up. Uh, earnings, top 50 weight, uh, this is the IBD 50, this is the growth index, FFTY, top 30 growth companies, which are the ones most slammed. The cumulative earnings power of these top 30 weights in that FFTY ETF um, have gone up by 3.87% in the past 60 days. No one would guess that. That's what's happening. It's happening under the surface, which is why we do all this granular research and do all this work. So we are not swayed by emotion. We just deal with data. Basic materials. Uh, remember, everyone was pounding the table because they had a rally in the end of the year. And we said, we're not interested. You know, we're agnostic on energy materials, industrials. Everyone was chasing that. Well, sure enough, cats sold off this week, deer, all that stuff. Honeywell, you saw this morning. And um, energy and all those are down. Materials are down, and guess what? So are their earnings. Everyone was chasing it after the run. And what were we talking about before the end of the year? What was going to produce the last shall be first? Communication services and um, consumer discretionary. And those have been the top two performers this year, year to date. Think Amazon, etc., which we've talked about ad infinitum. All right, let's go to the article, the ask me anything questions section. So um, I think a lot of you get value out of this, uh, but for those of you, oh, by the way, I just want to say something here. Um, if you're getting value or you've gotten value from these over the years, I put a ton of time into this every single week and I enjoy doing it for my clients and I'm happy to share it. Um, uh, if you, if you got value from this or previous episodes, the greatest compliment you can pay me is to share it with one friend. And how you do that, you just, if you're watching it in um, at hedgefundtips.com, there, there's a link up here or down here. You can just click on YouTube. It'll take you to YouTube. And then you just click the share button. Obviously, if you like it, that's great. If you write a comment, that's great. That'll train the algorithm to show up more people. And the more people that see it, the more incentivized I am to keep doing it for non-clients. Uh, and uh, But this is where it really, uh, the rubber hits the road. And you could just simply click on this, uh, you know, share it on social or, or email it to a friend and, you know, just say something like, hey, I know you follow markets. You may like this as much as I do. End of story. You know, you don't have to pitch them on it or anything. Just be like, hey, I've been watching this for a number of months. I made some good money with it or I've, I've enjoyed watching it. I've learned new things. Uh, I thought you might find it helpful. And I think most of the people you're going to share it with, if they are into markets, are going to get some value out of it. And that's going to get the message out to more people. And that's going to make us want to do it for a long, long time, uh, even for non-clients. So um, thanks on that front. So let's get to the Ask Me Anything questions here. Uh, Patrick Kelly, I've been watching your weekly YouTube video since last summer and enjoyed watching the CPS trade develop. It must feel good 
to see it play out exactly as you've envisioned. Uh, I know you're not crazy about Brazil, but I would be interested to hear what your thoughts are on VINP, which is a small cap asset management platform. They seem to be well positioned, but I also understand that there's substantial political risk. Keep up the good work. I forwarded, oh, I forwarded a lot of your videos to friends who have an interest in finding asymmetric opportunities. All my best, Pat. Thank you, Pat. That's, that's pretty nice. Um, it's like you read my mind. Um, okay, so VNIP. Let's take a look. VNIP. Okay, now, keep in mind my nature. You guys have known me for a while now, and some of you haven't. When there's dislocation, there's dislocation in Brazil right now. I want to go to the highest quality uh, businesses. I'm sorry, VINP. The highest quality businesses. This is a small cap. I'm probably just going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to take country and company risk. I'll take the highest quality company that's down 50% in a country that's just decimated. Uh, second thing that's a red flag for me is only two years of data. I have no way of seeing how this is performed through cycles. So for me, it's a pass immediately. I'll just take a quick look at the financials to see if you're anywhere, um, you know, wh where, where your thinking process is and, and maybe I can contribute something there. But those two things right there are just boom, process of elimination. Um, but there are people that can do well with that. Okay. So you're seeing here. Fundamentals improving. Let's see. V I N P. Okay. All right. So they were growing revenues. Now it's come in. It's been a tough year. Let's see. What are the margins here? Okay. Hundred percent gross margins. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, operating margins have come off a little bit, but they're still very high. Net income, what's it earning? Three bucks a share, it's trading at 10. Um, yeah, I understand the attraction here. I mean, cash flow from operations is solid. Free cash flow. I mean, gosh, what's the market cap on this? All right, we'll wait for that to come. Uh, let's see here. Jeez. Uh, yeah, I mean, these things are declining, but what type of asset management do they do? Portfolio investment products covers private equity, infrastructure, real estate, credit, public equities, hedge funds, investment products, high net worth products. Founded in 2009. I'd probably want to see the, I'd go to the IPO prospectus and I'd look back at like the, the financial data that they published in their initial prospectus and try to get, you know, five or 10 years back and get a better understanding. Um, I understand why you're looking at this. I wouldn't, I, I personally wouldn't do it, but I can understand why it's worth looking at and maybe a, punt, a small punt for you. Um, but that, that's where I would start. Get more than two years of data, get the data from when they were private. Some of it should be in the prospectus. Um, here it is. Okay. So this is a half a billion dollar market cap. So it's probably got like a 20% free cash flow yield. Um, 7.7% 7 .7 dividend yield. I mean, Look, I mean, some of the some of these things that are too good to be true sometimes aren't, um, especially when you're dealing with emerging markets and flows are just short term negative. Uh, I'd want to understand their credit book and their exposure to, uh, you know, if there's any consumer credit risk in that. Um, worth exploring more i mean you just have to do the work listen to some of the conference calls but for me there's just not it's 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 not what we do but i i definitely think it's worth looking into further 
Um, JT Investor, Tom, how hard did you laugh when you saw the cover of Barron's on Saturday? <laughs> that was the one that uh, China thing is just getting started from our uh, formerly bearish and now uber bullish um, uh, emerging markets writer. Maybe they will do auto suppliers this weekend. <laughs> that's funny. Keep up the great work. Would also appreciate your thoughts on HBI. That's Haynes Brands. Seems like a good company with a bad balance sheet, but fixable. They managed through the great financial crisis just fine with an elevated levered profile, implementing cost-cutting measures and poised for some easy comps this year. Supply chain freight costs no longer major headwinds, plus a dividend yield of 7.5. Seems like a nice bonus for being patient, assuming it doesn't get suspended. Later this year, if they breach loan covenants, their products are timeless. No fashion risk with other apparel companies, but also no brand moat. No, I mean, they have a brand moat, but, you know, you now have Kirkland. You have all these brands that you didn't. When, we, when you were growing up, you had either Buffett's, uh, Buffett bought um, Fruit of the Loom or you had Hanes. Or if you're a single guy, you got to wear the fancy stuff, you know. But uh, that that's basically it. Now you got Kirkland. you got all these other things coming into play. Amazon, I'm sure, has their own brand. But leaving that aside... Uh, replenishment drives recurring sales and as you pointed out cotton seems to have rolled over which may help with margins and sell through if they pass along savings to retail consumers uh, we'll need to review historical margin trends versus cotton prices over time to confirm uh, seems like an interesting uh, potential value play that could get cheaper over the next couple quarters giving investors time to dollar cost into a position that builds up over this year while management continues to execute on cost savings and refinancing the upcoming debt securities prior to maturity dates Thanks for your thoughts on this one. Have a great week. Uh, and then part two came today after it they cut the dividend. Uh, HBI cut the dividend. Stock got cheaper quickly. I think it's down 25% today, which I thought was a possibility in near term uh, with expected sell-off based on immediate reaction. Would appreciate if you'd factor this into your thinking as part of the earlier question. More bad news priced in today. And dividend cut seems like a prudent step to improve balance sheet. Thanks again for your thoughts on this one. Okay, so um, let's take a look here. Where is the, okay, here we go, HBI. Okay, so it's down from 20 to now 650. I guess when he sent the first one, it was at eight. Now it's at 650, they cut the dividend. Um, let's see what's happening with the financials. cash flow is kind of sporadic it's it's like it's a good business it's a cash positive business for the most part it looks like i did take a quick look at it before i got on i think they took a big inventory write down which a lot of these companies did because they overstocked for covid or stocked the wrong type of stuff um probably a lot of sweatpants and no one's buying them because they now have to go back to those empty office buildings that uh that landlord is dumping back to the bank, which uh, the smart real estate guys will then buy it from the bank at a, at a huge haircut. Um, all right, let's see here. And either convert it into residential or just wait out the cycle until everyone's forced back into the office. Uh, okay, so, no, that's not gonna work, okay. Go back to 2012. All right. So you got revenue up from 4.5 to 6.5. It's come off a little bit in the last year. Margins are relatively stable. Uh, I think this is probably a similar balance sheet issue like Cooper had. And I think credit markets are getting easier and easier as we move forward and rates are going to be coming down lower and lower to finance the high yield debt as uh, financial conditions ease and the Fed stops. So that's probably a good thing. Um, net income. So they're earning about a buck a share. The dividend is now cut. 
and the balance sheet is the issue they've got I think 3.6 billion dollars of debt I if I if I remember correctly I think there's yeah six and a half billion of revenue so they are levered the cost of capital is going up they cut the dividend um, Look at the cash flow statement. So they change in inventory. So they took a big write down in inventory. So that's what affected the cash flow in the short term. It seems most of these, they had a similar situation in 2018, but not quite as bad. But on balance, they don't have those type of problems. They seem to get it right more often than they get it wrong. Um, Repurchase of common stock, de minimis. So the dividend, they were paying about $200, $200 million a year. So that's going to save them. Uh, they can pay down some of the debt, which is their plan. As a matter of fact, I pulled up this article. Haynes Brand plunge after dividend cut, gloomy earnings, and outlook forecast. Uh, lost a quarter of their value. Report earnings on Thursday, fourth quarter loss, 16% decline in sales. Consumers pulled back. Retailers cut orders. Sales were down 8% in 2022, expected to fall again this year. So this is a declining business. Um, dividend cut was part of its uh, shift in its capital allocation strategy aimed at bolstering its balance sheet and increasing financial flexibility. 60% uh, payout. Okay. Paid nearly 157 million in dividends during the first nine months. Yeah, over 200 for the for the year. Said it expects about 500 million dollars in cash flow from operations during fiscal 2023. Expects to refinance its 2024 debt maturities during the first quarter. This would be a catalyst if you're confident that they get it done. Um, you have to size it accordingly because if they don't, they're toast. Like one of uh, Icon's owned a auto supplier retailer, auto supplies retailer that competes with O'Reilly and um, O'Reilly and Advanced Auto Parts and they went bankrupt today. Probably because it was a crap business losing money for a long time, but it's not a guarantee just because a good business like CPS can get it done that a medium business can't. I think Haynes probably can based on their free cash flow. Uh, and taking the proactive step of cutting the dividend. So that could be a short-term catalyst. Um, but I want to understand more why their sales are declining. This is not a good trend. So that I have to understand. Uh, maybe it's a lot of discounting to get rid of the wrong type of inventory. I would have to listen to the calls, and I'm sure, JT, you'll, you'll do that, uh, knowing your background. Um, For the first quarter, Hate Brands expects sales of about 1.35 to 1.4, making 11% decline compared to a year earlier, along with the per share loss of the. Uh, yeah, there was something in here, though, in the stripping out the one time adjusted earnings were seven cents to share. Now, what was the one time? Was that an inventory? Oh, reduce. Okay, reduce inventory position. Okay, so uh, the tough thing about this one is it's not a great business. It's not a terrible business. If they get refinanced, it probably goes from you know six to ten or twelve. But they've got to turn around the declining sales, and I don't. I don't think the story is as clear as the auto story. Like, I mean, if you could tell me the average person's underwear is 24 months versus the average is 12 months when they replace it, and like they can't they can't keep wearing you know old underwear if they're going back to the office, I'll buy the story. But I don't think there's any good data on that. Um, uh, I'd be more interested in what's their share. Is their share declining? Are there new entrants to the market? I think this is more of a trade than a business I want to hold forever. I mean, you, you basically have a business that's done nothing. It was trading at $6 back in 
1998. It just seems like a dog that pays out a big dividend. Um, I think it'll work for a punt. I think they'll get refinanced and maybe you get a double out of it. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to take that level of risk for a quick double. I, I want it. I'm willing to take that risk if I can have a multi bagger over years because I believe it's a great business. Um, more works to be done. You got to listen to the investor presentations. You got to listen to the calls. You got to understand share. You got to understand competition. If you can get comfortable as to why the sales are declining and how they're going to normalize and get back to regular levels uh, in 24, 36 months, then it's probably really interesting. But that that takes a lot more work than 10 minutes on a call. Um, Jason says, hi, Tom, could you share your thoughts on 3M earplug lawsuit and current valuation? I realize this likely wouldn't interest you given the limited upside, not a multi-bagger, but it's an interesting situation with them spinning off their healthcare business and also not being able to utilize bankruptcy proceedings to shield liability, at least so far. Thought there may be a swing trade opportunity building, but I guess it predicted ultimately on the side, predicated ultimately on the size of the payout of the earplug liabilities. I'm not sure how to value that or even if you can. Uh, do you have experience on how the market tends to price these type of situations? Big call a 10 figure lawsuit uh, that has merit, substantial payouts. Can't believe the lawsuit would put them in a bankruptcy. Da, da, da. Can you humor me on how you played the situation? I usually would put this in the too hard pile and just take a pass. Uh, I think 3M is a great business. I think they'll come out of the lawsuit fine. I have no way to quantify it. I'm not a lawyer. But if I was wanting to put a position, I probably would speak to a lot of lawyers who specialize in this type of thing. And I just work my network to talk to people like that before we put on a position. Um, but I'm happy to put things like this in a too hard pile. Now, uh, in that list of 200 stocks that I showed earlier today, there are a lot of them that are only doubles over the next two, three years. Uh, so this is 3M, by the way. Um, I think 3M is okay. I, I I really don't care about a swing trade. I don't want to take that risk because if they get some ridiculous settlement and then they've got a ridiculous uh, outcome and then they've got to appeal it, the stock goes down before they appeal it and get it normalized to something realistic. So I, I wouldn't put any size. If you want to take a punt on it, take a punt on it. Um, oh, so of those 200 stocks, a number of them are only doubles in terms of the stock, but in terms of how we position. So... If you think about what we do for, for clients in some cases, you know, you might put 90% in stock and you might have 10% uh, in a long dated call spread with EV of 5X. So a two bagger turns into a three bagger, a, a double turns into 200% over three years, which is a more attractive IRR, even on a boring conservative stock and you're taking bigger risk on only 10%. So if you're wrong on the huge move and it only doubles, uh, you know, you would get 90% instead of 100%. But if you're right, you get 200% instead of 100%. And those are the kickers that we actually, we actually prefer boring stocks that are only going to double because there's less risk embedded in them. And the, and the way we have experience over 15 plus years in working in derivatives, and that's exclusively what we did with Cornwall, um, uh, and understanding vol implied volatility and, and all the all the Greeks, uh, we love those companies that can only double in the stock and that will be our core position. And then we'll put kickers on. And even if we're wrong about the kickers, by the time the trade's done, we made so much in the stock that it didn't matter about the kicker, but the kicker could add one or two more turns in terms of X's, 2X, 3X, 4X, with very, very little risk. And that's how we juice boring positions that are predictable with massive returns it's like how could you make 4x in you know uh you know some boring company like disney or some boring company like amazon that's only going to go up 50 or 75 percent it's because of how you position you put your core stock and then you have your kicker and that that's a whole level of expertise and training that takes you know many years to master but uh um we we do that and that's why we are so excited about those names you may have looked at some of the names and like the ones that are really down, you know, don't earn any money, we wouldn't touch them. But the ones that are only down, you know, 50% that would revert back to their mean and only be 100% trade, we'll get two or 300% out of those uh, positioning them now before they take off. Once they take off, you can't get that 
5x EV on the kicker that you would have in the in the environment like this when the VIX is you know below 20 where you really want to pounce. Um, okay, uh, let me just see if we have any other. Oh, Nick Saltarelli um, asks. Do you have a position in Farfetch by chance? Okay, so he's trying to reverse engineer the company. We're not going to go public with that company because it's already up. Um, I think it's up almost 100% since we uh, talked about it. So we're not going to go public with that. We're going to just leave that for clients. Um, if it comes back and we plan, you know, to, to we, we built a very strong starter position in that. Uh, we weren't able to finish our research by the time it took off, but we've got plenty there and, uh, we, we don't know if it'll go back to be able to, to load up more and we're perfectly comfortable because we're fully invested in everything we want to be in. Uh, that one does have multi-bagger potential, but it's not far-fetched and that's all I'm going to say about it there. Uh, Gabe Farhadian, uh, thanks for, thanks again for your weekly insights. Have you had a glance at? MATX, small cap transportation company, mostly ocean freight. Uh, they have excellent expedited fur service to China. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, all right, I'll take a quick look. Uh, let's see. MATX. All right. I feel like I'm Taylor Swift standing for 3,000 pictures after her concert. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's see. Gross margins are expanding. Cash from operations. This looks like an aberration more than uh, a trend, but let's let's see if we can understand it. M A T X. This reminds me of Zim. Everyone wanted the Zim shipping up here. I'll show you Zim. I got pitched on Zim right up here. And it had all these attributes. All I, I don't I don't like I don't like uh, shippers generally. They're too cyclical. It would have to be down at like five dollars, and the balance. And I was comfortable they weren't going bankrupt for me to get interested. And it may never get there. And the same with Maddox. But let's just see. I, they're just it's like, it's like miners. No matter how good conditions are, they find a way to screw it up sooner or later. Um, other than that Fredrickson guy in Norway, I don't know anyone who's ever gotten rich in shipping other than Onassis. And I mean, there are some that are the operators and they buy ships when they're out of favor and play that cycle. But buying the stocks, no, the stocks are not set up to make the shareholders money. That I can tell you. They're set up to make, make the guys like Fredrickson money. Um, I mean, wow. Yeah, this thing's growing, though. Um Let's see the balance sheet. So you have to understand in this environment, the balance sheet. All right, 500 million, that's not much. Income statement, they're growing. So they, they've, they've, they've doubled these last two years. Um, and you have to really get comfortable with what has changed. Why is that gonna persist? I mean, th th this is off the charts. So is this another Zim shipping that had the same type of thing and then they collapse because uh, it's so damn cyclical or what's changed that they're going to keep growing like this or anything like this uh, moving forward? Let's see here. Overview. Uh, ocean transportation. I, you're, you're rarely going to meet anyone that makes money in ocean transportation stocks over time. They always stay too long. Um, it's like when you hit you know, 31 on the roulette table, literally take your 100 to 1 and go home. And no one ever does. And that's that's the exact case with ocean freight transportation. They hit these jackpot 
payouts and they stay at the casino too long and uh, sure enough those two Jack and Cokes cost them $10,000 or whatever it was most expensive two drinks they've ever had and that's what ocean transportation is all about you stay too long at the table and it's the most expensive lesson you're ever going to get uh, refrigerated commodities packaged goods automobiles footwear okay so they're shipping shipping should improve like the story is all going to make sense until it doesn't until excess supply comes back into the market and you get smoke so you got to time it perfectly you got to be like a, a ninja with these things um it's, it goes in my too hard box. I think it might be good. I mean, I'm looking at these numbers objectively, Gabe, and it's like, of course, look at it. It's growing like crazy. But I'd have to listen to like 12 quarters of calls. I'd have to read the annual report. I'd have to understand the cycle. I mean, here, here's, all I, here, here's all I'm thinking, actually. And I, need, I should have just mentioned this in one key word. Here's all I'm looking at when I think about that company. So they had these peak earnings with peak Baltic dry index, this is completely rolled over. So they're gonna be facing pricing competition and I don't wanna be in that business. And uh, I think the market started to discount it and it may discount a lot more. Now, if you have some insight as to why this is gonna go up and there's limited supply of shipping, uh, you know, have at it, I'm open to hearing it, but I think this is telling me everything I need to know and that is to take a pass, take my chips and go home. Gary C., what do you think about natural gas? Isn't it oversold and how far down can it go? Uh, which ETF companies would you look at? We own range resources and Comstock resources from much lower levels. Um, I actually looked at adding to the positions, which is not normally my thing. Um, You know, I think we have like a double on Comstock. And um, 6X on range resources. So we own what we want to own on that. I mean, I would consider adding some Comstock here but I think you might be able to get it at lower prices before you buy it for the long term. So we're not, I don't have any fear of loss of se or sense of urgency. I own what I own from much lower levels. And um, if it got really lower, I would definitely lean in, but I don't think it's gonna get there. It may, but that's kind of my view on that. As far as the commodity, we went through all the commodities last week. Um, all right, this guy just sent me a random question. In what instance should one invest in high yield bond market rather than low yield? We're, we're, we're equity guys. Um, I would just say we like when the market is dislocated rather than by like completely dislocated, like the great financial crisis, we not only start with the highest quality, like if we're going into a country, we go with the highest quality uh, companies. Uh, when the market is crashing, we go with the highest quality companies. Um, but even then, like we'll look at the high yield debt. And, you know, if it's trading at like 40, 50 cents on the dollar, just because the market's crazy and credit markets are freezing up, we might do like a zero coupon bond where we would buy debt at a 50% discount and then make up to par with equity. So if we're wrong and the equity gets wiped, we still can get made whole on the entire position if we feel comfortable that we're high enough in the capital structure and the um, uh, and mostly secured by the underlying assets then we'll take that punt because if we're right, we get a number one, we're collecting a super high yield on the high yield debt. Um, we get a double on the, the bonds over time till they pay out at par. And then we have the equity kicker, which if the bonds are trading at 40 cents, we're probably gonna get a four or five bagger, at least on the equity, if the debt works out. And if we're wrong on the equity, we could still be made whole. And if we're wrong on everything, then we shouldn't have been in it to start and we didn't do our research properly. But uh, that's really what we, we never we never invest in high grade bonds. That's that's for uh, that's for uh, you know widows and orphans type stuff. Um, all right, and that's that. So uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, 
you know, as I said, if you get value, click the share button, share with one person. I'd appreciate that. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.